All right, so uh, we've been discussing bone, um, bone remodeling and this idea that as we apply new forces, we have to accommodate uh, uh, those new forces by supporting the bone with uh, additional bone where, where forces have increased. Uh, we just made it through that example of the shoe and we get our foot so when we're walking in the middle we've now reorganized uh, the forces that are being produced on either side of the foot and so how does the the bone actually respond and we start with our osteoclasts and our osteoblasts with the remodeling process Now, real quick, give me a review. Osteoclasts do what? An osteoblast build up. All right. So, in this example, remember that the outer aspect of the bone in our example of the shoe is now experiencing a higher long force. So, what is your thoughts on that outer aspect? What do you think is going to begin to happen? What, what would we need to have happen? We got more force now, so we need to add or subtract them. More force. So we've got to add bone. And what cells do we use to add bone? Osteoblasts, our bone builders. So if we increase our force, it's that increase in force that will help to recruit those osteoblasts, those bone building cells to that uh, to that side of the bone, the outer aspect of the bone. Now when the osteoblasts arrive, those blasts, anyone remember the picture they can begin to lay down on the bone? Osteoid. And that osteoid mixture contains a chemical, it's calcium and phosphate. Anyone remember what the name of that was? Hydroxyapatite. So the osteoid mixture contains collagen, which forms that lattice work. So we begin to create some new lattice work, and then the hydroxyapatite contains the minerals, the calcium and the phosphate, that help to harden that collagen matrix. So that's going to be the outer aspect of the leg. What about the inner aspect? So the inner aspect of the leg, more or less force. Do you remember? So less force. So if we have less force now, we need more or less material. Less material. Now if I need less material, what do I have to do? I got material there, I don't want as much, I want to get rid of some of it, so I'm going to need what type of cell? The osteoclast, because that's my bone removal cell. So those osteoclasts begin to remove that material. So you have bone reabsorption on one side of the bone that releases our chemicals that make up hydroxyapatite into the bloodstream. On the other side where we need to form bone, those osteoblasts are pulling the calcium and the phosphate right out of the bloodstream to begin to lay down those new minerals to put down that new bone that's going to be required. I hope you all just built your confidence quite a bit because you did, did really well on uh, creating down a physiological process. Okay, now if you all promise not to pass out, we'll talk about bone repair. 
Some people don't really like broken bones, but that's what bone repair is all about. All right, so you have some sort of trauma when you break a bone. And there's a lot of things that happen at that point when the, when the bone breaks. And we're going to need to repair it. Uh, and in order to repair it, we're going to need some of the same types of cells that we've already been talking about. So bone repair, again, is required after a bone break. And at that time of trauma, which I'm using the term trauma here just to simply reference that point when the bone has just been broken or snapped. We're going to call that a fracture. And there's a bunch of different types of fractures, and I'm sure you've heard of some. There's pretty minimal fractures, such as the stress fracture. And then there's pretty major emergent fractures, such as a uh, compound fracture where the bone actually sticks out of the skin, which is pretty awesome. Now, with the compound fracture, obviously, we have to put the bone back in. We have to set the bone. But the whole process, the physiological process, is going to basically be the same whether it's a stress fracture or something as major as a compound fracture. And really, when you go to the doctor, the doctor is not really giving you anything that's going to help the bone to go through the healing process. They're stabilizing the bone, maybe with a splint or a cast, so that the natural physiology that's uh, inherent within the organism can begin to go through the repair process. So when you have a fracture, which is what you can see here, you get some really jagged fragments of bone. And those jagged fragments of bone begin to tear apart other tissue. And in particular, we cut nerves, which is what is responsible for the pain that you feel when you break a bone. And we also rupture vessels. And as you rupture those vessels, blood begins to pour out into that area and begins to surround the break. And it's very important that this happens. So as that blood begins to pour into the area, we form a structure that's called a hematoma. Another name for hematoma that you'd probably be more familiar with is just simply a clot. So the nerves are broken, and that's that kind of instantaneous pain that you have because you're severing those nerves, and those nerves send a signal to the brain that says, wow, that's a lot of pain. But then pain kind of persists. I'm assuming that most of you are maybe... All the guys, at least, are probably really controlling. <laughs> so you get pain that lasts for, for a long period of time. And that's actually no longer associated with the nerve system activity, the severing of the nerves. It's, it's actually associated here with the form of the hematoma. But we need to form this hematoma, even though it's going to be associated with pain and discomfort. You can manage that with ibuprofen or other pain fillers. But it's very important that the hematoma forms. Because that hematoma is going to be the uh, first ingredient in going through this repair process. And that really begins just about instantly after you break, and within a few days, <clears throat> after we experience the trauma, we begin to have fibroblasts. Okay, so we begin to have fibroblasts. This, again, is a type of cell. We know that because it's a blast, just like we've seen with the osteoblast. And the fiber is referring to the fact that it's going to begin to lay down fibrous, uh, fibrous proteins that are going to begin to build a matrix that we can build, begin to build off of. So the fibroblasts enter the break. 
And as they come in and take up residence, they differentiate into chondrocytes. And this is a cell that we've talked about. And we know it's a cell because of CYTE. So these chondrocytes, anyone remember exactly what these chondrocytes begin to do? I'll give you a hint. Think bone development. So we have those bone models, and what were they made up of initially? Cartilage. Chondrocytes associated with cartilage. So these cells, these chondrocytes come in and, uh, well, first they're fibroblasts. They differentiate at the site of the break into a chondrocyte, and now we have the ability to get, begin to put down cartilage. So that's going to be the first thing that begins to happen is we kind of fill in the break with cartilage. And this should be very... Uh, familiar from the bone development process. Basically, we're going back to bone development to repair this break, and we're going to put down a model of cartilage, and we're going to build off of that. Now, the cartilage is actually just a little bit different. Anyone remember the name of the cartilage for bone development? It starts with an H. Hyaline cartilage. In this case, it's going to be a cartilage called fibrocartilage. So that fibrocartilage begins to be deposited at the break, and you can see that it's going to span that gap within the break. In addition to um, the, the fiber being put in there, we actually are going to make this reconnection. between the two sides. And so now we have basically the gap filled. Now if we were to take that bone out, we'd be able to bend that, that, uh, that break because the cartilage is not near as stiff as, as bone. So the hematoma has become this cartilaginous plug that we call a callus. So it's very tough, but again, it's soft. And it's going to act as the place where we can begin to build new bone. So that's within the first couple of days. If we get in about a week, we would begin to see osteoclasts. Now that may surprise you a little bit because what does an osteoclast do? It breaks bone down, but I've just been told... I just told you we're trying to repair the bone, right? But the osteoclast has a really important purpose here because if you look at the site of the break, you're going to find fragments of broken bone still present. And we want to get rid of those. We want to dissolve those fragments, release the minerals from those fragments, and that's what the osteoclasts are going to do. They're going to go in and they're going to mop everything up. So they consume the bone fragments, clear out some of the cellular debris from the hematoma, and really it prepares the space so we can begin to build a more appropriate lattice work. So we're going to begin to prepare that space for the lattice work. Osteoclast function is going to begin to depress and we're going to begin to see osteoblasts Osteoblasts do what? Build bone. And how do they build bone? Yeah, we got a deposit osteoid. An osteoid is going to contain collagen that begins to build the matrix. And so we're, we're kind of over here now, kind of in this transition between the, first, uh, the second figure where we're now taking that, that callus and we're beginning to turn it into a lattice work with our osteoid. And now we're going to begin to deposit our minerals on it. So our calcium phosphate begins to accumulate. Now notice that the bone here is 
quite a bit wider than the uh, bone that was not affected by the break. So the bone is going to be thicker. And even as you go through the rest of the process, six to eight weeks from now, uh, from that point of the break, you're going to have bone that's been reestablished, the vessels have been repaired, nerves have been repaired, so you have regenerated tissue, but as you can see, you're left over here with some uh, additional bone mass. Now most people will be like, oh, so the bone is stronger. Yeah, not really. It's, it's going to be stiffer, but it's more brittle. So the, the break is actually maybe stiffer, but it's not, it's not going to accommodate forces quite the same way as a healthy unbroken bone. So don't go home there and break all of your bones. Uh, so all right. With that, what I'd like to do is shift gears here just a little bit. Um, skeletal system was made up of bones. We've discussed bones for the last few days. We have two additional structures. They're going to be the ligaments and then also cartilage. And ligaments and cartilage collectively come together to form the articulations between bones, what you would call joints. So really what I want to do, and we're going to try to finish this up today, is to discuss the ligaments, which are going to be responsible to take bone and attach it to another bone to keep bones close together, to keep that joint capsule in the right, um, in the right position. And then we'll talk a little bit about cartilage, and then we'll come back and we'll put it all together in our joints. So ligaments are bone-to-bone -bone connections. Ligaments consist of collagen, which collagen, anytime you hear the term collagen, think of long strands of protein. Collagen is what makes up um, a good portion of your hair, which for most of you is a relatively long strand. Even if it's been cut short, you still can grow a pretty long strand that would have a lot of collagen. By the way, collagen has a lot of sulfur. And so if you've ever used a hair dryer and you burn your hair a little bit and it kind of stinks, that's actually the sulfur being released from the collagen fiber. I was totally excited about that. But collagen, big, long, um, fibrous proteins. Our ligaments are going to have these long, fibrous proteins kind of laid down together in parallel to make up what sort of looks like a band. So in other words, we orient those collagen fibers in a regular, same direction pattern. Now, when you look at various ligaments, what you're going to see is they have a very low concentration of cells. And the reason that is, is collagen, this long fibrous protein, gets packed in there so extensively that we have a very low number of cells that actually can be fit into can be fit into the spaces that are in between our individual collagen fibers. And this in lies sort of a little bit of a problem. It's the way that it is, but it is a little bit of a problem to have this low concentration of cells because that means that you don't have a whole lot of room for things like capillaries. So capillary supply into a ligament is actually really, really low. Now, remind me of your name. You had ACL surgery, right? What's your name? Okay, so you, you, at least, you didn't have to have surgery. You had stabilization. What was your name again? Okay. How long did it take for your ligament Four months. Broken bone, maybe six weeks, which is still quite a long time. Cut, you may get out of your hand in a week. We're talking four months. And that's because those ligaments don't have a great blood supply, low concentration of cells. And so they don't heal very fast. So when you injure them, you're knocked out for quite a while.
They help to give strength to the joint and help to maintain those articulations and maintain movement. Okay, so low capillaries. That's supposed to be the pollen sign, so a low number of capillaries means that they heal really, really slow. So you don't injure your ligaments. The third tissue type, bone, ligaments, and cartilage. And again, we're going to kind of take ligaments and cartilage, put them all back together to form our joints. We'll do that in just a second. Um, cartilage is a tissue that contain a couple different types of proteins, one that we're familiar with, collagen, but another one that's called elastin. And it's called elastin because of its elastic properties. So it helps with flexibility. We're going to find these proteins uh, in cartilage in something called the ground substance. I'm going to explain that here in just a second. Now the ground substance, um, when you look at a tissue, you basically have individual cells. So this would be an individual cell, here's another individual cell, maybe here's another one. And then you have this space around the cells. And this is a water-containing space. Frequently we refer to that as the extracellular fluid, the fluid that's outside of the cell. In the case of bones and cartilage and ligaments, we give that extracellular a specific special name called the drone substance. So if this was a cartilaginous tissue, we would see in the space between the cells and that extracellular fluid or that ground substance, we would see these proteins all kind of oriented in ways that would hold that tissue, uh, that tissue together. So this ground substance is that watery material outside of the cells where we're going to find those proteins. So what is the purpose of cartilage, and, and where do we anatomically find cartilage? Cartilage is going to provide cushion for all of your bone-to-bone uh, -bone contacts. And really, we see three different types of cartilage associated with those bone-to-bone -bone contacts. Is everybody doing all right on the speed here? The fibrocartilage, this is going to be a form of cartilage that's resistant to changes in pressure or tension. So you have at the tip of your tibia, terrible tibia, but that would be something similar to the tibia. There would be your fibula. And then you'd have your bones here of your ankle and your foot. Okay, so that's a great, beautiful picture. The tibia, this would be your knee joint. And you have the femur that comes down. We want to protect the surfaces of those bones. And so the knee has fibrocartilage that sits kind of right, kind of like a disc on top of the tibia. That fibrocartilage is called the meniscus. And this prevents every time you jump or you run, it's keeping the, uh, the two bones from contacting because of those changes in pressure and tension. So that's an example of the fibrocartilage. You'll see it in other places as well. The next cartilage form we've already seen with our bone models that we build in uh, embryogenesis and uh, pedogenesis. It's a hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage gets stacked up and covers the tips of those articulations where the bones are going to move. It's a very smooth cartilage, and it provides smooth movement. So we're going to find this on all the surfaces of our mature bones. 
So as you're moving your bones around, you don't have direct bone bone contact. You don't have bone rubbing on bone, which would be really problematic. And then the last form of cartilage that we find in mammals in particular is elastic cartilage. And this is, hopefully you see the term, um, or, or can think of the, the things that are elastic or the hands, all that kind of stuff. And you think, okay, really high degree of flexibility. So any place that we need a real flexible structure, it's most likely going to have been built with elastic cartilage. And so here you can think of the tip of your nose or your ears that um, are real flexible. Those are made up primarily of that elastic cartilage. Okay. Anybody have everything they need here? So now what I'd like to do is take it and put it all together. And I want to discuss the joints. And joints are going to be our points of contact. So wherever you have two bones that come together, you're going to have a joint. And there's three different types of joints that we can classify in humans. The first type is the fibrous joints. The second is the cartilaginous joints. And the third type are the synovial joints. I'm going to come back and hit on each of these three. We'll spend most of the time on the synovial joints because those are most of the joints that are involved in your, your knee and your shoulder and your hips are all synovial joints. Okay, so let's start here with the fibrous joints. So you can see here uh, we have the cranium of the skull, and there are bones in the skull, and they come together and they actually do form articulations. Now these articulations don't move a whole heck of a lot. Uh, in the adult, at least, they move a ton in babies, and that's we've got this soft spot on top of the baby's head. That's a uh, fiber joint so that the bones can collapse as they're expelled from the vertebrae. So these fibrous joints really are more of a remnant. And now in adults, they have no or very little movement. So very little movement in adults. In the, the fibrous joints that you're looking at here, um, in the skull, they're going to be called sutures. And so if you've seen a skull bone before, I think probably with those in the lab, there's all these little wavy lines on the skull between the individual bones. Those little wavy lines are called the sutures. So those sutures are a type of fibrous joint allow very, very little movement. But if you look at the suture in high enough detail, you actually have little filaments of um, cartilage that, that span that gap. And there's tiny little filaments in there. Um, so it's not just simply that the bones are fit together real tight bone bone. You actually still have cartilage in there that separates each of the individual bones, but it's on the microscopic level, not the macroscopic level. These fibrous joints in infants provide quite a bit more movement, and the movement's required again, as I've already alluded to, because this egg is in the birthing process. And it persists uh, for. Um, uh, quite a while after birth, up to about the 
year and a half to two years, you have a soft spot um, in the middle of the brain. There's actually a couple other soft spots that you can feel that are not as prominent as the one right at the center of the top of the head. Uh, but during the birthing process, the, the bones of the skull will actually press up together, and so the baby's head might look a little bit like the cone and then it resets within a couple of hours after birth. Uh, and then that soft spot continues uh, to um, go through a process of, of ossification to become more and more solid until really you have an appearance of bones that are just directly attached together, held together by sutures. Second type of joint, or the cartilaginous joints. And our cartilaginous joints uh, are primarily going to consist of hyaline cartilage. And they provide a minor amount of flexibility. Typically, the cartilaginous uh, joints are going to have a, a disc of cartilage. You can see that we have a disc here uh, represented for both of the vertebral samples here. And then this is the, the pubis bone, which is part of the pelvic bone. There's a joint right in the middle of the pubis bone called the pubic synthesis. Now, these disc like Cartil uh, cartilaginous joints, uh, many of them are actually really responsive to changes in hormones. During the birthing process, you have a release of hormones that interact with the synovial joint there, I'm sorry, not the synovial joint, the um, pubic synthesis. Uh, and it causes that, that joint, that particular cartilage, to become more lax, um, higher level of elasticity. And so during birthing, you actually have that joint that spreads out as we go through the pelvic bowl as the head and body of the baby go through the pelvic bowl on the way through the, uh, through the bird channel. So just the example to remember here in your notes, places like your vertebral discs. Which shown here, that plate-like uh, cartilage. Now, by and large, the most common joint that we have in humans, in all mammals, for that matter, are the synovial joints. And our synovial joints are really going to be of the joints of movement. So we use synovial joints for movement. And we have to stabilize the synovial joints with our ligaments. And we basically have a variety of degrees of movement that each of these synovial joints can make, but we want to keep them within limits. So you don't want your knee joint to bend all the way up so you can keep your forehead. You want it to be prevented from going too far, because if you allow it to go too far, you can have uh, breakage of the bones and disruption of other tissues, which is problematic. So think of synovial jo uh, joints as being places where two bones contact and have to move. And so we want to do a lot to make sure that that movement doesn't cause a lot of injury or, or other problems. So in all of our synovial joints, we're looking at um, a synovial joint here. Um, not really knowing exactly what that synovial joint is, I would guess it's probably something like your elbow or your knee. So the very tips of the bones are going to be covered up by hyaline cartilage. And that shouldn't really be much of a surprise because that hyaline cartilage is that very smooth cartilage that allows for smooth movement to occur.
So you have the high line cartilage, and then surrounding the whole, um, what I'm going to refer to as the capsule, we have this membrane, and it's kind of shown in this light minty green color. That capsule is called the synovial, I'm sorry, the, the capsule is called the fibrous capsule or the synovial um, capsule. The membrane that lines that capsule is called the synovial membrane. So the synovial membrane is going to line the joint. And that synovial membrane is, it, is the tissue that's going to be responsible to produce a fluid called synovial fluid. Now the synovial fluid that's produced by the synovial membrane enters into that, that joint space, that capsular space or that joint cavity. And in there, it acts as a lubricant. It's a pretty viscous solution, just like motor oil. And so it protects those moving parts and helps to lubricate those moving parts. Now, the whole structure, which you can see here, sort of in a, a tannish color, is the, is the joint capsule. So the entire joint each of the synovial joints is going to be encased. Inside a structure called the joint capsule. So the very exterior is the joint capsule. And you can see that we're going to have ligaments that help to support it. There are also be ligaments not shown here on the inside of the capsule to keep those two bones from moving too far in that kind of lateral direction. Then you have the joint capsule. On the inside of that joint capsule, you have the synovial membrane producing our synovial fluid. And then you have our highline cartilage, which protects the tips of the bones. So that's a basic anatomical rundown of each of our synovial joints. They are going to have a little bit different appearance depending on the joint. And really, if you think about it, our joints are going to provide different types of movement. I really only can move my elbow in two directions. I can flex it or I can extend it. But my shoulder, I can move it in a variety of different directions. So even though they're both synovial joints, their anatomical structures look very, very similar, but there are some differences. And as we look at those structural differences, uh, we categorize them based off of how many different movements they can make. The first main structure, which is going to include um, things like your shoulder joint and your hip joint, they form what's called the ball and socket. And you've all probably heard that before. And in a synovial joint that's called a ball and socket, you have one bone that has a structure that looks similar to a ball, and then another bone that has a depression or the socket, and the ball fits inside of that socket. And it can move in a variety of different directions. It's not restricted just to that kind of one directional movement. So in this ball and socket, our first bone has a ball-shaped protrusion. where our second bone has the socket. And that socket is going to be a smooth depression. Now you should still expect to see things like the hyaline cartilage, uh, the synovial membrane producing synovial fluid, the joint capsule, ligaments, you should expect to see all of that because it's a synovial joint. That's the base of the anatomy for a synovial joint. Now, these ball and socket joints, they allow a very wide range of motion or motion range. So you can move your shoulder from front to back and from outside, back, inside, in a variety of different uh, a variety of different directions. The 
second type of joint has a little more restriction, and it's called a hinge joint. Your elbow and your knee are examples of hinge joints, and in your mind you should be thinking hinge of a door. The door only moves really in two directions. It opens or it closes. You can't, open, you can't swing it up and swing it back down. It just moves in those two directions. So our elbow or our hinge joints are very restricted in their movement. So similar to a door hinge, it really just allows two movements, and the movements in opposing directions. So for example, the hinge joint of the elbow can extend the elbow and in the opposite direction can flex the elbow. Now there are actually a couple other types of joints, but I'm not going to uh, I'm not really going to dwell on those types too much. Hinge joints and ball joints cover a good number of our joints. We also have joints that allow rotation, uh, uh, or I can move my finger back and forth, kind of like it's on a saddle. We call those saddle joints. So there are different types of joints, but if you know ball joints and you know hinge joints, you know a good number of joints. What I really want to finish up with. is moving synovial joints. And to give you the terminology that you would use in describing the movement of joints. And now most of you have probably uh, at least seen a weight room before, and maybe you've actually been in a weight room and done something before. And so you've used some of these terms. You know what a uh, extension exercise is, or a flexion, and you've done bicep curls to flex your bicep to try to increase bicep mass. But there are probably a few that you've never run into before. So we'll start with some that are familiar and then we'll get into a few that maybe aren't as familiar to some of you. So flexion is this idea that you decrease the joint's overall angle. So if you consider my elbow joint here, if I'm just sort of in a neutral position, you might describe that angle right now as close to 180 degrees. It's probably more like 170. So if I flex my elbow, I'm decreasing that joint angle, going from 170 tending towards zero. Now I can't get all the way to zero, maybe you can get to about 30 degrees, but it's still going to be flexion. The opposite of flexion is going to be extension. And that's going to be the increase in joint angle. So as you increase your joint angle, you go from maybe a starting position close to zero and tend towards a 180, and maybe you can even get a little past 180, maybe I'll say even 200. Synovial joints can also be moved through rotation. And that's this bottom figure down here. You can see they're rotating the tips of their elbows. So rotation is this idea that we can rotate a body part. around an axis, around some sort of central segment. Uh, it's probably one of your favorite synovial joint movements. If you want to have a test on Friday, that would be rotation. It's rotation. Next is a uh, Circumduction and circumduction is really a combination um, of some other movements. Two that we talked about, two that we're about to talk about: um, flexion and extension, and then abduction and adduction. Those four movements make up a circular motion when they're all put together in one movement that we would call circumduction.
All right, the next pairing you can see here at the bottom is abduction and adduction. And a lot of times, uh, you know, people who study anatomy overemphasize here because they sound very similar. Abduction, adduction, abduction, adduction. So they call one AB duction and the other one AB duction to differentiate. AB duction or abduction is the idea of moving a limb away from the body. And in particular, you're moving it away from the body's midline. So when you look at an individual, I'm standing here in front of you, the midline goes kind of right through the center of your eyes, through your nose, and then out between your legs and between your knees. That would be the midline. And we can describe motion from that midline. So if I move something away from that midline, say, rotate my shoulder joint away from that midline, this is abduction. If I add it back in or bring it back in, that's AD adduction. that limb, limb towards the body. So let's swing the arm back in or I guess swing my hip joint back in. That would be adduction. The final two forms of motion are supination and pronation. These are opposite. Uh, supination is, uh, usually supination and pronation are reserved for either the hands and the feet. And so you can rotate your hand or your foot rotate your hand or your foot in an outward direction. So you might walk on the outside of your foot and you would be a supinator, description of your, of your game. Um, or you can rotate your hand so that it's palm up. Now, really in the arm and in the hand, knowing supination and pronation if you're studying anatomy is really important because we use these things called directional terms to describe locations of structures. If I wanted to know where the uh, two bones in the hand are, the ulna and the radius, the hand has to be supinated because then the radius and the ulna are parallel. If I pronate, so now my palm is up, the bones actually cross. And so the top of the bone is going to be in opposite orientation compared to the, to the uh, lower portion of the bone. So you have to supinate to get into the what would be called anatomical position. And then to get out of the anatomical position, you would pronate. <clears throat> so with pronation, rotating that hand or that foot inward, you can rotate the hand so the back of the hand is up, or a pronator would be someone who walks sort of on the inside of their foot. And if you really walk on the inside of your foot, which would be duck walking, you're called an over pronator. And it's best to be kind of in between a supinator and a pronator. That was kind of the example that we gave with the application of new forces and what would happen with bone development. All right, so that's everything I got for bone. Uh, as you're packing things up, we got in the any questions or comments or concerns? Um, next up, we're going to be looking at the muscle system, which is chapter six. Uh, today is February 3rd. So we're about three lectures behind. We missed three lectures when it's snowing.
Um, but we're still going to be on target for our first exam in February 19th. That first exam is going to cover chapters 1 through 6. 1 through 4 is the, the cell stuff. 17 uh, is also included. That's going to be cell reproduction. And then 5 and 6 are skeletal muscle, or skeleton, skeletal system, and muscle system. All right, so just be looking for uh, that exam on February 19th. Hopefully you're already have been studying. So the question up here, Andrea just asked, how long are tests? They are 50 question multiple choice tests. They roughly take most students between 30 and 50 minutes. I'm not sure. 30 minutes, and then it takes like five. You're a lot smarter than me.